Uh, this is story arcs and role-playing games presented by me, Captain Mike. I am Captain Mike. Just a reminder, I'm Captain Mike. <laughs> story arcs and role-playing games. Um, all uh, role-playing games, they're collaborative storytelling, but they're not always played out that way. Oftentimes, it seems like uh, these concepts that we see in movies or, or books or what have you, uh, we try to translate them over to games, and there are some hiccups along the way. Sometimes there are outright failures, as I have often found occasionally, rarely, once or twice found. Um, but I've done some hard thinking uh, because uh, most of my day is just sitting around thinking about role-playing games and PowerPoint slides. So these are my thoughts on it. Um, and without further additional ado, uh, let's talk about me a little bit. <laughs> so I am Michael, Captain Mike Clegg. Uh, I started off with Dungeons & Dragons, so of course I have the Cardinal Six uh, st uh, statistics. Uh, I am a presenter, I am also a teacher, which undoubtedly comes as, as such a shock. I have a master's degree in writing, a bachelor's degree in English, 30 something years of role playing, uh, give or take a year. Um, so you can do the math on that one yourself. I am also actually a teacher, which, like I said, very surprising, um, given my love of simplistic PowerPoints. Uh, although I will say that this is among my fanciest of PowerPoints. Coincidentally, you also noticed that my uh, email address is at the bottom of every slide to avoid anyone just posting it and stealing it Because I assume you might be clever enough to steal my slide, but not clever enough to remove a tiny bit of text from the bottom uh, But I can be reached at Captain Mike at CaptainMike.net in case you have any questions um, after the fact uh, Or do you just want to email me and tell me I'm great? Uh, or if you have any other ideas or questions that you want to bounce off of me I'm certainly happy to do that. I often don't by the way check my email until I get back from a convention um, furthermore, I understand that the uh, app, the guidebook app, uh, before it didn't seem to be working, but now it does seem to be working. You can rate this class and indeed all of my classes. Uh, so I encourage you to rate it highly if you believe that it is great or not rate it if you don't think it's great. <laughs> I'm kidding. I do actually appreciate honest feedback, of course, all the time. Uh, I just like it better when it's great because I'm so great. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to either raise your hand in traditional classroom fashion, and I'll call on you, um, or you can just shout it out in more conventional, modern way. Yes, ooh, already. What level are my stats? Well, in the original Dungeons and Dragons, your stats were not affected by level. Um, so you could have these stats at level one or level 100. Not that there was a level 100. Um, but as a human, I have unlimited class advancement. That's a great way to find out how old everyone in the audience is. <laughs> way to out yourselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did, just for backstory, I started with uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition, um, although I did play some Dungeons and Dragons basic. Uh, most of the time I have played Dun uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition. Um, the other editions kind of left me a little tepid, partly because I'm old and dislike change and fear new things. Um, but also because I just felt like they were, many of them I thought were good systems, but they just didn't feel like Dungeons and Dragons to me. They felt like different fantasy settings. And my friends are all, many of them are the same age as I am, and we all kind of grew up playing the same thing, so that's what we did. But at any rate, fortunately the story arcs comparison works for all kinds of systems. And I do play many systems besides Dungeons and Dragons. Good question though. All right, um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah. Now, if you've been to any of my other panels, welcome back. Uh, and if you're going to any more of them, you'll see this slide again, because this slide is pretty much the best advice I can give to any teacher, any game master, any storyteller, any person looking to communicate with another person, or honestly, even a person trying to communicate with themselves. Uh, and that is that you should know your audience. Nothing is so useful as knowing your audience. Uh, there are different reasons for this, uh, different for different things, and you may notice that my spiel about this gets a little different, but in this case, it is important to know your audience because as you try to integrate classical story arcs into your role-playing games, or as you begin tweaking the way that the stories unfold in your role-playing games, you may end up with a very different style of gameplay. 
And you'll find in many cases I'll talk about doing things you know, more story-like or doing things more mechanically. Nothing is wrong as long as you're having a good time. That's like the basic thing about role-playing games, right? As long as you're having fun, who cares? Um, but if you're changing how the game rolls, if you're changing how things play out and what's expected of the players and what's expected of the game master, uh, it's definitely worth having a dialogue with your, uh, with your players about that uh, or with your GM if you're the player and you're planning on giving these notes to that person. Uh, because you know, we all come to gaming for different reasons. Sometimes it's to explore a fantasy world full of elves and floating loaves of bread. And just saying if you're still with me. Um, but sometimes, you know, at the end of the week, we sit down and we're like, oh, I've had like a 50 hour shift at the floating bread factory. I just want to knife some orcs. Like, can I just do whatever? Or like, oh, you know, my family has been just such a headache. I need something uncomplicated uh, or possibly a dragon to vent my frustrations on. Uh, so there are lots of reasons to come to gaming uh, and there are lots of reasons that we all enjoy it. Know your audience. Cool? Cool. All right. The problem. You can find your inspiration for role-playing games in a lot of places, including movies, books, TV series, not mentioned also video games. Um, these are great sources for inspiration. Uh, the Lord of the Rings is two out of three. Three out of four if you include video games as part of the list. Um, you know, maybe you're watching a movie and you're like, this is amazing, you know, at the, there's this huge dramatic thing that happens and that's so cool and I'm just so psyched, I can't wait to, to run a, you know, a similar sort of adventure with my friends or you're reading a book and you're like, oh, everything kind of like, oh, they, they misinterpreted this and that meant that they ended up going here and oh, that was so perfect. Things role-playing games aren't. Movies, books, TV series, not on the list, they're also not video games. This is the inherent problem. These sources of inspiration come from media that are significantly different fundamentally from the role-playing experience because role-playing is an experience. It's collaborative storytelling. If you're just guiding your players through a very set series of things, getting them to say the things you want them to say, do the things you want them to do, that's not really collaborative storytelling. That is you storytelling with some interns, which, I mean, hey, I'm not here to tell you how to spend your Saturday nights, but it's not really role playing. So I kind of broke these down in my own mind uh, into what is it that makes these things so different? What is it that makes it difficult to move from one thing to another thing? Uh, and one of the uh, one category is the issues of the medium, how it is that you're trying to convey the story. Uh, part of it is that the game structure is about the game itself. It's about the role-playing game. It's not necessarily about the, a narrative in the same way that we normally see a narrative unfold. So D&D is a great example, especially original D&D, which was basically, you know, enter the dungeon room, kill the monster, take the treasure, move to the next room, kill the monster, take the treasure, repeat until the pizza arrives. Uh, and so it's not really looking to promote the polished narrative. Also, uh, and oftentimes in movies, uh, you know, the characters, you know, they're, they're trying to like pick the lock while the, the people are creeping around. They know someone's there and they're like picking the lock. And then it's like, oh, they're, got, they're about to get caught. And then, oh, they got the lock just in time. And then they jump through. And then the guard is like, oh, I guess there was nothing here. Uh, but that doesn't always happen when you have a game mechanic like rolling dice for lock picking because maybe you're not going to get it in time, or maybe you get it like super early and there's just no tension. Like you just walk in and you're like, whoop, it was like it was unlocked, and the guard doesn't even get a chance to notice. These can be definitely cool things, and certainly as characters get good at things, they get better at, at doing those things. But the game structure isn't designed to enforce the narrative, it's designed to enforce the mechanics of the game, because it's, because it's a game. Uh, and as a result, the RPG story structure, or uh, not as a result, but uh, the RPG story structure is often predictable. Characters enter a place, deal with the place, get a quest, go on the quest, fight, 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 mini boss, fight, fight, boss, treasure, turn in the quest. 
I mean, that's kind of the standard structure. If any of you play World of Warcraft or basically any MMORPG, or in fact many video game RPGs, it follows the same structure. It's kind of up to you to build your own narrative in it. But that's not the same narrative structure that we have with a story where we have an introduction and then we have complicating uh, events and so forth that you're moving into the climax. Um, and so the, the structure of the RPG st uh, story, or I should say adventure module, is often very predictable. It's like, oh, this character was introduced. We just found out that a new guy came to town called like Wolfie Howlmoon and people have been going missing every full moon. I invest in silver. Uh, the other issue of the medium is that there is no script. Oftentimes in movies, movies especially, people always say the right things at the right time, even when they're kind of like, they're not the right time, they're at least hilariously so. Uh, but there's no script for gaming. Yes? Oh, there's total, there's always, there's always room for subterfuge. Even if you don't think there is, there is. Um, certainly there's subterfuge and certainly, you know, Wolfie, Wolfie Full Moon could just be like an unfortunately named tradesman who, you know, it's like, why is everyone always trying to lynch me? <laughs> and then like it turns out that his assistant, you know, um, Dr. Von hates werewolves. Uh, he's like, is actually the werewolf or something. Obviously that's a ridiculous example and you should not use that unless you really want to. Um, <laughs> Dr. Von hates werewolves. Speaking of no script, uh, certainly you can layer in subterfuge, but uh, you know, players actually, as as jumping past no script, players may be overly genre savvy. Like, it, let's let's face it, players they're not dumb, right? They recognize the stuff, and oftentimes, if you're playing a game in a particular genre, it's because the people who are playing like that genre. So they're going to recognize tropes. They're going to recognize the setups for many things, and that can be difficult if you're trying to put together a more or less standard story arc because all of the elements that have come up, they're gonna see coming. Now, you can, of course, subvert that and twist it and change it and so forth. Um, these are not, like, these, these are not uh, um, impossible to overcome problems, but they're things that need to be addressed. Um, good question, thank you very much. Uh, so, yes? Uh, going back to the predictable thing. Sure. Is it okay, like, would you say, like, it's okay for a story to be predictable at some point? Oh, that is a, Good point. Uh, the question was, is it okay for a story to be predictable at certain points? And the answer is absolutely. Um, story structures are structures because we're so used to them and we're so used to them because for thousands of years we've really liked them. It's not that humans haven't come up with better story structures, it's just, we just like them. Uh, you know, the old expression, there's only what, like eight or nine storylines in the world and it's everything else is just a permutation of them. Um, yeah, and especially if you're just trying to move your characters, or sorry, your players, and thus the characters, kind of along the storyline, you can make it predictable, like, okay, we get it. Every, all of the signs point to the idea that when we go to rescue this person, that person's actually the bad guy. Like, we get it, we can see it coming, we can react to it. Um, so you can use that to help guide the storyline, uh, but the problem may come up with, uh, when you're trying to do things that are supposed to be a surprise, and they're totally not. Uh, perhaps an extreme example of this, which does not shine very well on me, but it's at least hilarious and you can learn from my mistakes. Um, I had a, a friend who was running a campaign and I was a player, and this is not my finest moment as a player, but I gotta be honest. Um, and we had gone through quite a few adventures. Like this was definitely a very lengthy campaign. We had gone through many adventures. Um, but my friend was, a very, uh, was very fond of modules, and he would take the modules, and credit where credit is due, he did a lot of work to integrate it into the overall story and make sure it fit with all the stuff, but you could still kind of tell when he kind of had one that he hadn't really fully enmeshed or one that he hadn't tweaked enough, um, because it kind of stood out as being like the filler episode in your favorite series. And so we came to this town, and everyone was like, uh, nobody goes out at night because people go missing and the, like the local graveyards had been uh, interred or and what have you and I was like, oh cool, this place is full of undead uh, and everyone's like, but we don't know what it is. I'm like, yeah, it's undead uh, and so 
as adventurers, we were, I mean, that was kind of fair enough because we're adventurers and we dealt with undead before and we were like, yeah, the problem is probably like ghouls or whatever. Um, and so the adventure kind of like moved us towards like the governor's mansion at night. And the adventure, I assume, was supposed to be that we would go investigate the governor's mansion, either find entry or break in and sneak around and then end up in crypts or something. Um, you may have guessed from how I phrased that, that's not what happened. Um, that week I had kind of like had a rough week and I was not in the mood for crawling around crypts when I know that there are just ghouls in there. So I may have thrown a rock through a window and then cast fireball and then left. <laughs> While I did that, everyone else was discussing how they were going to break into the mansion and then possibly deal with some ghouls. Meanwhile, I just, I firebombed the governor's mansion. Now, everyone was, was, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I didn't stick around to ask any questions. <laughs> I'm still a little ashamed. Now, in character, my, now, the other characters, by the way, justifiably furious. <laughs> also, completely incapable of stopping me because <laughs> I'd already done it. And nobody knew enough water spells. And also because burning ghouls started falling out of the building. So they're like, why would you do that? Maybe there were innocent people in there. And I was like, it's raining ghouls. And then the, the whole place collapsed inward and the GM, bless his heart, he's like, just kind of has this like defeated look in his face and he's like, and the place collapses inward revealing a series of catacombs that are now filled with flaming degree. And I'm like, Problem solved, one spell, who's for drinks? And everyone's like, what if there was an innocent person in there? I'm like, then they were a ghoul, probably. My official report will say full of ghouls. Now, smoking hazard. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not really proud of that, because, not because it isn't hilarious, because I still think that's hilarious, obviously. Um, but the problem was that, like, imagine if you went to see a horror movie <laughs> and it was like, I know what you did last summer. And the person was like, oh, wait, I know that voice. Wait, you must be calling me from inside the house. Hey, you're behind the couch. Punch. 911? Yep. Good. And like the rest of the movie was just them watching Seinfeld. <laughs> like, oh, that was weird. Glad they're in jail. Uh, like it's a strict, a total tonal shift. I derailed that story terribly and for that I can never apologize to him enough, which is to say I never apologize, but I should really get around to that. Um, but that is kind of an issue of the medium is that he was trying to create a fairly classic story arc, but I was too genre savvy and just too tired and maybe a terrible person. And I just completely destroyed it. Yes. Yes. Yes, a perfect example. You know, the swordsman shows up and you know they're supposed to be like this whole clever thing and then just kaplow. Uh, fortunately, that's an instance where that's turned into like a character moment and indeed, uh, the GM was light, on, light enough on his feet that the rest of that adventure was not just us eating pizza in sullen silence. Um, <laughs> which would have been fair. Uh, but it was actually the party bickering and trying to like come to grips with the fact that one of them had just decided that it was okay to use probable cause as a reason to use fireball, which is not technically book procedure. Um, so he did turn that around, but that wasn't what he was expecting and I derailed it. it. It definitely broke the classical story arc that he was trying to go. Uh, go on, and it, which kind of brings me to this idea of the no script. There's just no script, so sometimes, you know, in, in, in movies, you're watching stuff and people always say the right thing at the right time. Sometimes it's like, oh, it looks like we're never going to be able to, to stop Dr. Explodo's bombs. Uh, he's, he, he's done this too cleverly. There's no way to, to undo, to choose which, which wire it is. And someone's like, yeah, uh, man, we'd have as much luck as if we were colorblind. <gasps> That's right. Dr. Explodo is colorblind, so I'm going to choose the gray wire. You know, whatever. Why would that even work? Not all of these are planned in advance. <laughs> um, 
But we don't get that those elements from those classical things where just the right idea is mentioned or someone says just the right thing that inspires the next person to come up with the idea and so forth. We don't have the same kind of banter back and forth necessarily um, in the same way that we can just make it happen when it is one person telling a story and then writing it out and revising it. Uh, and then lastly, of course, the problem is the dice, which we were talking about earlier, having lots of dice. Everyone loves dice. That's why we play role-playing games, unless you play a role-playing game that doesn't use dice, in which case that's cool too. Uh, but dice don't really play by our rules. They do whatever they want. So, hey, maybe you've got the, the bad guy down to like, uh, you know, d backed into a corner and this is supposed to be the part where you turn the tides because that's the most dramatically appropriate thing and then he critically hits you in the face and you die. That's, a, that's not how that was supposed to go. Uh, you know, I've had lots of adventures where, you know, maybe we were supposed to get to an adventure or maybe we were supposed to get to like some impressive villain, uh, but we never got there because somebody died because the, the just regular random encounters on the way killed us or so badly injured us that we had to stop doing the adventure and then like go back later. Uh, the dice don't care what your storyline is. Sometimes they're eerily accurate, but other times they're just like, nope, we're doing what we want. Which leads us to the other problem, the players. And also the GM. Uh, these are issues of the ensemble. These are the people that are involved because there are probably people involved with your role-playing game. I mean, maybe. I suppose you could set a bunch of bots to GM and play for each other, but they're not here. Uh, players have distance from what their characters are doing. You know, when you've got characters in a story and they're a they're hundred feet up on a snowy, icy ledge and they're, they're going across and it's really tense and they're like, should we, you know, should we go forward, should we go back, make the ring bearer decide, you know, whatever story you're doing. Um, the players can sit there and sit at the comfy table, you know, with like some pizza or like some Mountain Dew or coffee or whatever and they're just like, what would be the best thing to do? Well, we could do this. Well, we could do this. They're not directly involved with the, uh, with the, the dread or the violence or whatever. Um, hopefully your players are like there and they're like th trying to think about all of the stuff, but there's still that meta narrative that goes on. Like, would it be better to do this? Would it be better to do that? And oftentimes characters and stories hopefully, good stories, uh, act very much like people. They're in the moment. They don't always remember things. They accidentally do the wrong thing or they do the wrong thing on purpose because they think it's the right thing to do at the time. Uh, but we don't always have that, that kind of connection in a role-playing game. Uh, furthermore, character failure may dishearten the player. Uh, it is so difficult when I'm sitting there and I'm jamming and a player is just having no luck. You know, sometimes the dice are just like, nope, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. And then it's just like, ugh, why even like try doing a thing? And then they're like, okay, I'm just gonna, I gotta keep a positive mindset. I'm gonna try to do this. And the dice are like, nope. And that kind of disheartens the player, uh, which would not necessarily be the same case for the character because the character presumably would do everything in their power to succeed. And in fact, the more they fail, the more they may, have, uh, may try to fight to succeed because their life may be on the line. Um, whereas a, a player might just be kind of like, eh, whatever, it's probably just as easy to let this person die and then re-roll a character. Not my favorite way to approach characters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> generally speaking, um, but there is that disconnect. And of course, time between sessions, the ideal would be what? Gaming every day? 12 hours a day? Infinite pizza? Getting paid to, getting paid to do all of that. Ah, I didn't know you could make that better, but well done. <laughs> and getting paid to do all of that so that you can spend more money on, I don't know, dice? Dice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the click, click, click. Um, unfortunately, most of us live in a, in a horribly different world from that, we, and time between sessions can be as much as uh, a week, a uh, month, six months. I've had a couple of games that have met about once a year. Once I was in a game once where we were, if we could get a session every two years, that was aces. In fact, we haven't finished it. <laughs> it's been about five years since the last session. Um, and, well, you know, it's hard to get people in the same room or even in the same internet occasionally. Uh, but time between sessions can drastically change how a player feels. Maybe like one week you're like, all right, you know, I really want, you know, you're, you're playing your character and you're like, ah, we're just gonna, 
you know, bruise our way through this. We're just going to, you know, take no guff and, and just, you know, kill them all. And then the next week, you're feeling more bubbly and you're feeling more, like, upbeat. And suddenly, the character goes through this intense tonal change, which to the character is only, like, what, a minute, an hour, a second? And suddenly, they're much bubblier because the player is bubblier. This can create some disconnects which do not quite fit these kinds of traditional story arcs. And of course, all of this means that dramatic timing, ugh, difficult at the best. Um, I had a session where I had, I had a group of high-level D&D characters, and they were fighting their way through hell because that, that's just the game, that's the kind of game we were up to. They were fighting their way through the nine levels of hell because they had a bone to pick with a particular demon or a particular devil. And they were like, they got t basically got tired of waiting around for him to do something bad. So they were like, <laughs> like that's, that's the kind of high level I'm talking about. They were like, why are we waiting? Let's just go down there, roll up and punch him in the face. <laughs> and the rest of them were like, yeah, all right. <laughs> Give me two minutes to pack a sandwich. Um, and I was like, this is going to be great, because they, they decided, they set it up, and I was like, this group of characters has way too much good stuff. So I created basically a character killing machine. It was, I created this monstrous demon who dr permanently drained stats with, a, with his stinger tail, and he had like this cool set of weapons and all this other stuff. Uh, first round, first initiative, Vorpal Sword decapitates dead. Two hours of work, gone in an instant. It was just, it was gone. But at the same time, I couldn't like, I couldn't, fl I couldn't flub that. One, I mean, the dude rolled a 20 straight up. I couldn't take that away from him uh, unless I like kicked the table real hard. But it would have been too obvious, you know. Um, like I could have been like, well, it's a demon. It doesn't need his head and all this other kind of stuff. But I got to be honest, like that was just so cool. <laughs> I was like, I can't take that away from you. <laughs> That was the cool, that was so cool. Um, and so, but yeah, so dramatic, but the dramatic timing was like, that was supposed to be like a major pitched battle and it was done in an instant. So it did get some dramatic timing of its own, but it was not the kind I was expecting. I see a question go up. Nope, nope. Okay. Uh, okay, so blah, 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 blah. And a lot of it kind of comes down to this. Um, I could not for the life of me get any digital program to accomplish this. So I'm sorry I had to use a, f a cell phone picture of a marker board. But it really was the best I could do. <laughs> Look, I came here to talk to you about story structure, not whatever digital stuff this is. Uh, story structure. So we have the classical story structure. I'm going to flounce over here real quick. Where you get the exposition, and then the conflict, the crisis, the climax, the resolution. We all remember this from seventh grade, right? Um, which is the pretty standard kind of a set. And you can jazz that up a little bit with little bits here and there and so forth, and that's fine. But that's usually the basic arc. You get kind of like this sort of wobbly bell curve. Ad when you have a specifically designed adventure, it follows something similar, but it's a little off. The exposition, the hook, which is occasionally difficult to get people to bite on. I once had a game where the characters completely ignored the actual adventure and decided to just make their own. All of the signs were like, hey, you should meet each other in this tavern where you start off, because of course, and then steal this ship over here because it contains an unspecified treasure. That's not what they did. They instead got drunk, shot up the, ta the tavern, <laughs> and then stole a completely different ship <laughs> that was worse in every conceivable way. They went on to wander the ocean for a while, pull into port, accuse each other of piracy, and end up in jail. <laughs> that was the end of the adventure. <laughs> just a bunch of people in jail looking at each other like two women pointing at a house cat. Just... <laughs> Why did I hold the microphone to my face for that? Anyway, so you get the exposition, the, the hook plus the investigation period where you're kind of like, we don't know why the cemetery keeps getting dug up. If only some brave adventurers would find out. Go find out. And then they kind of bobble around investigating, hey, this is grave's dug up, this grave's dug up too. We should check all the way around town in case this happened anywhere else. Why? I don't know, just in case. 
eventually, fighty fight, fight, fight. Then a boss fight, usually. And then some sort of resolution. Typically, here's a bunch of experience, here's some gold, what do you want to spend it on? Dungeon crawls run a little differently. Now, if you're a classical D&D &D player, you might be familiar with the dungeon crawl, which is basically originally a randomly created dungeon, so already it had some logical loopholes. How did this giant get inside this 10 by 10 room? <laughs> How is it still in a 10 by 10 room? <laughs> we went through five foot high hallways to get to this room filled with six dragons. Do they, do they have like Grubhub in here? Yes. I, I like some buddies, uh, that reminded me of their logical explanation for it. It's like, yeah, dragons are amorphous. It's just nobody knew that. They just slowly <laughs> open the door. Just, <laughs> that is the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> just a dragon head. The door is closed and their finger is coming through the keyhole. My players know who to blame in case they have to deal with something like that. Um, but you end up with, it with an arc so to speak, arc like this, where it's just like random encounter, random encounter, random encounter, maybe a mini boss that was sort of planned, mini random encounter, random encounter, and then boss fight. Um, but the, the disadvantage to kind of having people go through a dungeon crawl is that it's very long and, and slow paced, but there's no particular way of knowing which battle is going to be the pitched exciting battle and which is going to be a long slog through 60 feet of uninteresting hallway, checking traps every five feet, or 10 feet, depending on your addition. So. You might say, Mike, this sounds like an awful lot of problems. I came here for answers. And I would say, well, then welcome to the second half of my presentation. Here's the answers. <laughs> uh, very feisty. Uh, bridging the gap. Uh, how do you get from the, the how do you get over these problems? How do you get from the one medium to the other and bring them together? Well, one, you gotta get everybody on board. Like I said before, you gotta know your audience because this may involve some significant changes to the play style. And hey, there's nothing wrong with dungeon crawls. I love me a good dungeon crawl, you know? Have a nice all day gaming thing. Let's see how many people, how many bodies we can throw into this nightmarish labyrinth until one of them manages to accidentally end up in the last room. Look, it's not for everybody, <laughs> but if you enjoyed, I don't know, Death Maze, you get the idea. Or Cube, if you're that old. Uh, but you've got to get everybody on board, because you're really talking about changing how the game runs. And that involves uh, buy-in both from the ga uh, Game Master, obviously, uh, but also from the players. They have to be willing to kind of adopt these qualities that may be less effective or seem less effective, uh, may, may require them to do more character work, which if they're there kind of to have a good time and not think too much and just roll the dice, maybe they're not into that much character work. Um, but you got to get everybody on board. Game, uh, you have to provide some kind of game benefit for doing things that are not beneficial. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to recommend it. Um, now, there is, of course, the advantage where if, if people are playing their characters and they're playing their characters from the character's perspective, there is, of course, the value to the overall story that's there. But as a GM, I think that it is important to provide things like experience points for role-playing in a manner that is true to the character, but actually disadvantageous to the party or, the, or even the goals at hand. Um, I think I may have already used this example in a different one, and if so, forgive me, but I'll do it anyway. Um, I had two characters in a recent game who are both shapeshifters. Uh, they were secretly shapeshifters, and they were not allowed to tell anyone who wasn't a shapeshifter that they were one. Uh, and so we had a situation where we had these two secret shapeshifters and one other player, or one other character, um, and they were trying to solve this situation. They were trying to scout out this area. The whole thing could have been solved in 10 seconds if they just shapeshifted, did you know, one turned into a bird, one turned into a monkey, you know, went in, checked the place out, came back. No problem. Piece of cake. Neither one did it. Because they were both very much connected to the idea that their characters would not reveal the secret. And even though as players they knew that each other were shapeshifters and they could get away with it, they didn't want to do that because as characters they didn't know and they couldn't reveal that secret uh, without realizing that they had revealed a secret. So they had to take this long, complicated, actually quite life-threatening path to their goal uh, because they just wouldn't reveal it. And so at the end, obviously, there's you know value in just knowing that you played your character so well, but it's all the sweeter when you get a little extra experience bonus as well um, because you should, exp you should reward good role-playing.
Oh, sorry. When you use a system that uses what? Oh, like milestones and so forth. Uh, so you can use other systems as well. Like most systems have some variation of the experience point leveling system, but even with like like feats or or, um, or powers, uh, you can give advantages. Uh, one game system I ran, um, rather than giving experience, or just rather than just giving experience bonuses for this kind of role playing, I deliberately wanted the game to have like an anime feel to it. It was basically anime Dungeons and Dragons in the sense of like Slayer, uh, or sorry Slayers, or you know that sort of system, um, or Fushigi Yugi. And so I wanted the players to feel like they were enforcing those kinds of tropes of anime characters. And so what I would give them uh, were bonuses based on the things that they did. So like characters could give combat bonuses by cheering on the fighters. So instead of getting personally involved, they could stand there and go, oh, he's using the striking marmoset technique. Oh, oh. And then like another person is like, that technique has never been bested. It looks like it was just defeated. You know where I'm going with this. Um, and I would give out um, what I called teardrop points, uh, which could be then turned in for like uh, re-rolls um, or like a, a plus 25% bonus to, to this, that, or the other thing uh, for doing other things, like things that were appropriate to an anime setting but seemed kind of goofy in a non-anime setting. Um, even things like that kind of like, I call them teardrop points because they're about those like cute moments where it's like, hey, why did you do that? Oh. <laughs> So you can actually just invent your own kind of systems. Uh, some systems have like hero points or force points. Uh, so you can use these kinds of ideas. Uh, one of our DMs uses uh, disposable uncommon magic items. Disposable uncommon magic items. That's pretty cool. Yeah, talk about a tangible benefit. Yeah, um, like one or two use magic items uh, that kind of come your way. Fate points. These are all great, great things. Good question. Thank you. Um, did that answer your question? Oh, good. I, I was like, I was like, thanks for your question, but I didn't check to see if I actually did. <laughs> so by giving these benefits, it helps the it does help with the player buy-in, and it also provides a way for uh, the best kinds of benefits are the ones that help them provide more character involvement uh, in the uh, in bridging the gap between the media. Uh, the scene setup. Sometimes you can set up a scene and just not do any rolling. You can set up a scene and just be like, okay, these characters are doing this thing. Um, the old the old West End Star Wars games, the D6 systems, if anybody remembers those, uh, they actually, on, in one of the, the books, suggested just having a small script for the beginning of a scene, just to get everybody into character. The GM would just write out some of the basic lines that it seemed like the players would likely put in their characters' mouths. And then you set up the scene that way, just to kind of get everybody into the character, into the scene, and kind of get it rolling. I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, I came up with an idea that I call the abridged dungeon crawl. I was watching, this whole thing, by the way, comes up because I was watching Lord of the Rings again. <laughs> and it was the scene when they're in, Kaz uh, when they're in the Mines of, uh, Mines of Moria. Uh, in Kazakh Dune, and they're like running through, and there's goblins everywhere, and then they're like running down, and then they fight the Balrog, and then you shall not pass. And I was like, oh, this makes me want to play D&D again, just as it always does. And it's going to be cool. I can set up a dungeon crawl just like this and do all this stuff. And then I was like, no, mm, wait, I've done this before. This always happens. I end up with a dungeon crawl, and it takes forever, and the pacing is very slow, and it's very casual, and it doesn't have that epic feel of like running around. I'm like, well, what is the difference? Oh, we don't see Gandalf and his minions, I mean, a fellowship of the ring. We don't, we don't see them investigate every room. Like, what's in here? Dwarf skeletons? Cool. What's in here? Dwarf skeletons. Awesome. What's in here? A goblin skeleton atop a heap of dwarf skeletons? Like, we don't see that for... 70 or 80, however long they were in their hours. Um, and so I was like, what if, what if I just took that part out of the dungeon crawl? And so I did, and it worked out pretty well. So uh, what I did is I just, I rolled up a dungeon and I figured out like where the encounters were, and I just fast forwarded through all of the parts that didn't have something happening or have a decision to be made. So instead of like you go 60 feet, you know, check for traps each each way. Uh, you come to a four-way intersection, check for traps. Down this hallway, you see this, and then you, and then you. Instead, what I did is I would say you go through the hallways and eventually find 
a four-way or a, you know a four-way intersection. Do you want to go left, forward, or right? We go right. Okay. You continue through the hallways and you come to a door. Uh, you come to a door. You know, listen for stuff. Pick the lock, whatever it is. Open it up. There's an ogre inside, and now he wants to eat you. And someone's like, "I got a plus four knife against ogres." And so it really, really sped up the game, which was great because most of the players were adults with busy lives. Uh, but it really helped take away that, that slow burn that we weren't looking for. Dungeon Crawls with a slow burn can be very helpful and, and nice in their own way, especially when you, you know, like go through all of the careful planning and the whole careful system, and then it pays off. And you're like, ha-ha, those monsters didn't know what hit them. Uh, but this really kind of led up to just those moments. It's just fighting the cave troll. It's just fighting the Balrog. It's just watching the wizard fall to his death. So that worked out pretty well. You can do that with other versions as, as well. Um, you can run things in an episodic style. Oh, sorry, yes. So, if you do that kind of like fast forwarding thing, how do you handle like always? What I do is I have them. Uh, I have the the rogue roll just once, and then that's it. Most hallways just don't have traps. I mean, like I, <laughs> statistically speaking, <laughs> I mean my house only has like four or five percent of the hallways trapped. Um, so I just have them roll once per fast forward, and then if they make it, and, and there's a trap, then they find it. And if they don't make it, then they don't find a trap. Slash sometimes get hit by a trap. <laughs> um, but then I just do it once rather than do it like every 10 feet. Because the assumption is still that they're doing the process, but that we just don't have to sit through it. Um, good question. Did that answer your question? Cool. Uh, so you can do things in an episodic fashion. So if you kind of keep the adventures to one session, that can pre uh, provide that sort of episodic quality. Or even if the adventure itself isn't one episode, break it down from a, a GM standpoint, like even before you get into it, just like, okay, this is how much I think we're going to get through on the session. Knock some off of that, because you won't. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, this is what I want to get through. And that's basically the episode. And then it's either, you know, you can do this episodically where you just have, you know, very short adventures, or you can do this as part of a long continuing thing, but it's just like, this is the episode where we do this, and this is the episode where we do that. Um, and that can really help with the pacing because then it's, you know, a little bit of the lead up and then the payoff and then the, some of the resolution as you can prepare for next time. It gets rid of the, the intervening time problems. It gets rid of the, well, we all forgot about the important character between week one and week three. Um, and so you can kind of just take it in those bite-sized chunks. Uh, recaps are also a great thing to do. And if you are like me and have kind of a spotty memory, uh, and you have a player that is really good at remembering things, you can have them recap and listen to them. <laughs> I have a friend who has an excellent memory, and I have been cribbing notes off of his memory of what happened for so long, I'm not sure if he's been slipping other things in. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, and so, uh, and likewise, I would also give, um, sometimes I would give rewards for, for recaps. Like, whoever wants to do the recap, they get a bonus. They either get an experience bonus or they get like a reroll or something like that. Um, or, uh, rather than putting it all on one person, you can actually have each person retell something that they think is very important from the last episode or the last session, which is also kind of a neat insight into what each person thought was very important. Um, so you can use this to kind of like work it together. That also kind of gets rid of the, the kind of mind fade uh, in between sessions. Now, maybe you're like, Mike, these are all great ways to bridge the gap, but is it also worth just not bringing them together? And I would say, well, sometimes. As I said, changing things to a more classical narrative structure, you can make that work, but sometimes that's just not what you want to do. Here are some reasons to appreciate the distance between the two media. Uh, tabletop RPGs are tabletop RPGs. I know that sounds redundant, but that's only because it is. So, tabletop RPGs have a particular design, but they have that design for a reason. They're very good at what they do. They provide you with random elements. They provide you with the ability to have a simple story structure that can be made complex just by nature of the random elements or the fact that sometimes the characters just wander off on their own. Sometimes they ignore the obvious thing and they steal the wrong ship. Um, even if they're very genre savvy, sometimes it works better because they recognize the genre savviness of it. And uh, 
when it comes to things like uh, dungeon crawls or even just those very long campaigns that go on, enjoying that ongoing progression, enjoying that setup, like we have a system, we check for traps, we do this thing, we do this thing. Oftentimes there's no trap, oftentimes there's no monster behind the door, oftentimes we go to the village and nothing is wrong, uh, but then when it happens, it's really fulfilling, you know? It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever bought a first aid kit and then couldn't wait for someone to be sick or hurt themselves. And you're like, that's ridiculous. But I did just get this new first aid kit. It has a defibrillator. A, de a defibrillator. It has the zappy paddles. And I'm pretty sure those cure everything. Pro tip, by the way, they do not. In fact, they can cause more problems. Um, but in, there is that strong payoff, and you only get that if you've gone through the slow slog. If you've gone through that slog, then when it pays off, it is so sweet and delicious. But it can be very slow getting there. And it does take, like I said, you got to know your audience. Certain players are looking for certain things. Some players really appreciate that slow, uh, that slow element. And one of the reasons they like it is because sometimes gaming is the only time we get to hang out with our friends. I have a game that meets uh, every Sunday night. We meet online because we are now spread across five different states. Uh, and we all meet online. We have been meeting online for a long time. <laughs> Year, years, yeah. Yeah, I think this game was, I think, oh, geez. I started, playing that, I started playing with these guys online in 2002. And we've missed a few Sundays. Uh, but we had a game that just went on and on and on, and then that game came to a close, and I started a new one with, this, uh, with uh, the same people, because like, I was like, I don't even care if this game is terrible. Um, I just want an excuse to be able to talk to my friends every Sunday, because I'm such a lousy correspondent that I can't guarantee that I'll remember to check in often enough. And so this means every Sunday I log in, everyone's like, hey, how's it going? Oh, I got a new job. I, you know, I quit my job. I, my kid's now this age. My kid's still that age. How is he still that age? Um, he's on a sitcom. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I wasn't sure if that joke was going to land. <laughs> i got to be honest. Um, but it's a great social time. Games like, uh, like Dungeon Crawls or games that don't follow a traditional story arc where like, everyone is, is involved and everyone is kind of like moving the story forward, there are great times where you can have a couple of people who are doing their scene or you're just doing the, the ongoing dungeon crawl thing where you're checking for traps, you're fighting the low-level monsters, and people, meanwhile, can have conversations. They can be like, oh, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. My, the other day, my boss uh, said I had a stupid shirt, so... Uh, today I'm wearing a stupider shirt, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're catching up with. Uh, so sometimes it's just that good social time, you know, get together with some friends, get some pizza. I've been saying pizza a lot and it's because I'm hungry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, you know, good social time. Uh, and it is a different type of challenge. That slow, not as predictable story arc is a way different challenge from the traditional prep for the bad guy, prep for the major... Uh, uh, the major conflict resolution because it's just different. It's one thing to have a loadout and you're like, okay, we've, we fought the, the bad guy's minions, they revealed the thing, we're heading to the denouement and other kinds of French words. We know that we're going to have the big showdown with the bad guys and it's going to be a special effects bonanza because that's where you got to spend the money. Um, and we're all set. There's, that's a different feeling, which is amazing, but that's a different feeling to going through with a backpack full of every potion known to human elf or dwarf with three different types of swords because you never know around the corner it could be a vampire or it could be a giant or it could be something vulnerable to pointy things and you got to be ready for the right one and then you turn the corner and you're like I have just what I need for this or that kind of fun dread when you turn the corner and you're like I still don't have what I need for this and you're just backpedaling, throwing potions as fast as you can. They're very different types of challenges, they're very different types of feelings, and both are great. But you gotta kinda choose which one to have. Although apparently sometimes you choose one and get the other. Uh, and of course, what is the best part about dice? They're random. There's a certain sense of unpredictability. Even that example of the characters who fought their way through hell and they were supposed to be having this huge drag out fight, it was so cool that 
and just just so so cool this demon comes up and he's like you know even had a brief monologue it's like you you know you thought you could go somewhere blah 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 and then there's one guy just walks up snicked and then just cheese the sword and keeps walking and I'm like oh that is too cool <laughs> I mean if that demon had exploded he'd have walked away and put on sunglasses and there's no way I could have predicted that because what was I going to do? I'd, he'd have to, he, he would have to do all of the things he did. He'd have to win very first initiative, perfect 20, using a vorpal sword to magically decapitate the demon. Like, what were the odds? Very high because I don't do math as if I don't have to. Uh, so the unpredictable is something that comes up that does not normally happen with standard story. Um, because that's standard stories are more scripted than that. They're more planned out, even if the intricate parts are not. So it is still nice to have that un unpredictability. All right. So the idea between these two things is that there are times where you want to bridge the gap. There are times where you can just appreciate the distance between them. How you play your game is, of course, up to you. And I hope that I've at least just given you some ideas of things that you can try out, things that you can do. Some people will prefer one style, some people the other. Sometimes you want to mix. Sometimes you want one or the other. Uh, but thank you very much. My name is and remains Captain Mike. And it, uh, thank you very much for coming out to my panel. If you want to contact me, you can reach me at Captain Mike at CaptainMike.net, or if you want to see me in person, I will, of course, be bumming around MAGFest for the rest of the weekend, and you can also see me at, uh, well, I guess only two of these five presentations. <laughs> You're going to have a hard time seeing me yesterday, unless you were already there. Um, but I do have at 4 p.m. building a better recurring villain, and at 8.30 p.m. putting the character back in non-player character. I will be hanging out a little bit. Oh, and don't forget, you can rate me on the guidebook app. Feel free to hit those five stars or whatever you feel is appropriate, and by that I mean five stars. Uh, I'll be hanging out if you have any further questions, but thank you very much.